This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the first of our numerous reading series events for the 2009 calendar year to celebrate 105 years of creative writing at Cornell University. Since 1905, when Cornell first taught creative writing courses as part of the English department's curriculum, some of the United States' most important writers and poets have graduated or taught here. Among the writers who have walked within the walls of Gorman Smith are E.B. White, Thomas Pynchon, Kurt Boddicket, A.R. Ammons, Vladimir Nabokov, Lori Moore, Susan Choi, Pulitzer Prize winners Allison Laurie and Arduino Diaz, and Nobel laureates Toni Morrison and Pearl Buck. By highlighting our writers, we hope to underscore the significant contribution Cornell University's creative writing program has had in the US and world literatures. Just direct yourselves to our English department's writers website or go to the new writers at Cornell blog to listen to J. Robert Lennon's interviews with our visiting writers to appreciate the full breadth and range of writers affiliated with Cornell. In the meantime, keep your eyes open for the announcements of our upcoming events, which include NPR's Selected Shorts, Rhythm and Readings, State Theater Community Readings, Cornell Scholars on Cornell Writers, various library exhibitions, as well as a, as a superb lineup of alumni writers. All the Centennial Plus Five reading series events are made possible by the generosity of two anonymous donors who are alumni of Cornell University. At a time when Cornell is feeling the challenges of economic pressures, the literary arts matter to the soul and core of any great university, and we wish to thank their generosity for keeping Cornell soulful. Our next event is scheduled for Thursday, February 26, and will feature poets Emily Roscoe, Lisa Steinman, and novelist Helen Schulman. In his research to write an introduction for our anthology plus five, and, uh, excuse me, in his research to write an introduction for our Centennial Plus Five anthology, Emeritus Professor James McConkie began seeking clues of our creative writing origins. Digging into archival material, McConkie found an issue of Cornell era, dated October 1900. The editorial declared a remake of the ma the editorial declared a remake of the magazine into a new publication with quote the best of literary intentions, unquote. McConkie concluded that the era, as a general utility paper of the university, was outliving its usefulness. Because its foundations were taken over by three other publications, the Alumni News, the Cornell Sun, and the Cornell Magazine, the new Cornell era would incorporate literary contributions. This first issue announced President Sherman wanted to encourage literary activity at Cornell and offered a prize of $25 for the best story written by an undergraduate. The announcement said that the president had made this generous offer to counter the, the sad lack of interest in things literary at Cornell. Well, wrote McConkie, $25 was a handsome prize in 900. Apparently, the president felt Cornell needed to emphasize literary achievements, including creative writing, and this new emphasis was reflected not only in the publication, but also in the offerings of the English department. McCockey's next step was to review the, the Cornell University Register, which was the course and faculty di directory. In it, McConkie discovered the first short story course offered in 1904-1905. In the same course register, McConkie also discovered the description of the first creative writing course offered by Corn Cornell University Department of English. It was called The Short Story. The description went like this. The study of selected specimens with frequent exercises in story writing for students wishing further practice in narration and description, open except by special permission taught by Dr. Andrews. Yes, 
the same Arthur Lynn Andrews of our annual fiction writing prize. In 1909 and 1910, Arthur Lynn Andrews continued to offer the creative writing course. In addition, that same year, a course in playwriting was offered by Professor Martin Sampson, who joined the English department in 1908 and became its chair in 1909. Fast forward to 1946, when Baxter Hathaway was recruited from Montana State University with the express charge of developing a writing program. A scholar, poet, and prize-winning fiction writer, Hathaway realized that, quote, at the end of World War II, change was in the air, unquote. Now the veterans of this very war were returning to the college campuses on the GI Bill. In addition to being older, Hathaway wrote, they were also, quote, full to the gills with their personal experiences during the war, unquote. In dire need of an outlet of expression, Hathaway reasoned, where to do it better than in a creative writing course. Yet, as Hathaway later recalled, quote, the development of a full curriculum and environment for creative writers did run counter to some Ivy League grain. I heard a lot about it, and I had to argue much. Nonetheless, mandated to design a program, Hathaway fully accepted the challenge and presented it to the dean, uh, the dean at the time, C.W. D. D. Kiewet, a full-scale plan for a Cornell program which involved undergraduate courses and for those in the graduate level, an MA. He also recommended launching a national literary magazine to keep the Cornell writing community in touch with the rest of the country. The dean accepted the plan with the exception of financing EPIC. Disappointed but not defeated, Hathaway, his wife, and a group of others financed, financed the magazine by contributing $100 each. Under the editorial guidance of Hathaway, the first issue of Epic appeared nine months later and inclu included the works of E.E. E. Cummings, Robert Lowry, Ray Bradbury, and a host of others. From 1947 to 1953, the writing program only ha had one member, Hathaway, with a, with a rank above that of an instructor, but who had half of the major students in the Department of English. Responding, the department hired Walter Sladoff in 1955, and our James McConkie arrived the following year. These were writers with PhDs, but fully dedicated to nourishing writers. It was Archie Annams who came to Cornell in 1964 who broke this pattern. By 1967, the college approved MFA degrees in the fields of creative writing, painting, sculpture, musical composition, and theater arts. One can only imagine the stories buried within the walls of Goldwyn Smith, the fears expressed by former writing students, the love and encouragement delivered by mentors hopeful for their charges. McConkie once wrote of having a young Tom Pynchon coming into his office to ask for advice. Quote, about two possibilities he was considering following graduation. He had been awarded a generous Ford Foundation Fellowship to pursue a doctorate in comparative literature, but couldn't make up his mind whether to accept it or enter this jockey school. <laughs> it, was only, it, was the only uh, it was the only time I've heard that there was such a school. I told him that if he, if he couldn't decide between the two, he should probably study to become a disc jockey. Later on, Pynchon wrote to Baxter Hathaway, quote, having the story in Epic was one major factor in my decision not to go to graduate school, but try to make a living writing instead. So its importance was, was in that gift of confidence from you to me, in which, though I am no expert at karma, Accounting, I am still deeply in your debt, unquote. Carrying on many pursuits, said Archie Annams, Hathaway fashioned a creative writing program which, uh, which was ahead of its time and a model for the courses now offered in almost every English department in the country. But programs such as they were, were not Baxter's chief end, 
Programs were for him instruments by which to announce the values that he admired in persons. These values he found in the mastery of knowledge, flexibility of tough, innovative dissent, and any changes that seek out and define what endures. It is then in the spirit of Boxer Hathaway that we begin the celebration of our centennial plus five. For he gave, he gave us a program with his immense dedication and against many obstacles. Certainly, Hathaway's vision to cultivate an environment for writing, for writing to flourish in is one that continues to be upheld by my creative writing colleagues like Alice Fulton, Phyllis Janowitz, Michael Cook, J. Robert Lennon, Ken McLean, Maureen McCoy, Robert Morgan, Ernesto Quinones, Larry Van Cleef Estefan, Stephanie Vaughn, Lamar Heron, Allison Laurie, Dan McCall, James McConkey, and Edward, Edgar, not Edward, oh my God, Edgar, I'm sorry. <laughs> Edgar, our beloved Edgar Rosenberg. I want to thank you all for coming, and now I would like to introduce Stephanie Vaughn, former director of the Creative Writing Program, and who has sat in over, I think if I'm not mistaken, over 60 MFA committees. Great. Yeah. yeah, and I sat on those committees one year at a time. <laughs> I'd also like to uh, begin with a couple of announcements. First, I'm introducing all three readers, but I'm doing it all at once, um, and I'll try to talk fast. Um, there is an error in the uh, program, which uh, d does identify Elena as the professor and director of creative writing, but also identifies me as the professor and as the director of creative writing. It's like the director who wouldn't go away, um, because obviously this is the template that we used last year. That's been, you know, it's uh, uh, it was an economy. We just printed right over it. Um, I'd like to also mention. Um, that it's the epic associate editors who uh, guarded the doors and handed out the programs tonight, put up the sign so people could find their way here, uh, that all of the readers tonight were epic editors, and that um, uh, epic is on your local newsstand uh, at the campus store and at Barnes and Noble. I hope it's elsewhere. We know for sure it's there. Uh, you should buy epic or some literary magazine. Uh, even when times are good, but especially uh, now. Keep them in business so that they'll still be working when you send in your manuscript uh, that will go into the archives along with the one by Thomas Pynchon. Um, <clears throat> tonight, um, we are here to celebrate the work of three writers who graduated from Cornell between 21 and 15 years ago. Uh, Julie Schumacher, uh, who graduated in 1986 as a tenured uh, professor at the University of Minnesota and the director of the creative writing program there, Melissa Bank, who graduated two years later in 1988, lives and writes in New York City and is our visiting writer this semester. Juno Diaz, who graduated in 1995, is a tenured professor at MIT. Uh, all three of them have been introduced several times in the last two days, so I will not be reading a list of their honors and their um, <clears throat> publications. Uh, which are on our website and all the posters, but of course they are three distinguished uh, writers. Um, uh, after um, Julie Schumacher and Juno Diaz re and Melissa Bank received their MFA degrees, they worked for a short time as lecturers in the Department of English, teaching creative writing, as many uh, or actually all of our MFA writers uh, graduates are still doing. If you are fortunate enough to be taking a creative writing course with one of those lecturers, you are taking a course with a future famous writer. <laughs> <clears throat> These three writers have been translated into many languages. Julie Schumacher's novel, The Body is Water, has been translated into German, Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish, Danish, Hebrew, and Greek. 
Uh, I couldn't get the, uh, the, all the languages uh, for uh, Melissa Bank, but I understand there are 30, and, um, and uh, at least 30 for Juno Diaz. What this means that is in some countries, their work is the work that constitutes American fiction in the 21st century, and it came from here. What is that work? It's hard to generalize. Uh, there are a few common denominators. They have each written about the colossal misfortune that can befall a human being, a family, or even, in some cases, an entire culture. They have written fiction that reminds us that sometimes there is no villain in life, just a kind of good luck or bad luck that challenges their characters into survival or an attempt at survival. Each of them, on more than one occasion, and I just noticed this about their work, has written about the frail nature of the family. They have written about the powerful emotional need of reconstructing a family once it has been shattered or deformed, about the need of children for their parents. They also write with the generosity of spirit that shapes the vision of their fictions. Just when you think you have met a bad character or a weak character in a story or novel by Julie Schumacher, Juno Diaz, Melissa Bank, the writer will give you a second look. We'll walk around the object of ridicule or source of despair, the bad man or woman or child in the story, and find a different angle that allows the faithless person, the betrayer, the abandoner, to be revealed as a complex person who may not be forgiven, but who is also suffering. Have I made their work sound grim? <laughs> it is not. I have laughed aloud at some point in reading every piece by every one of them. There is an exuberance and a bullience in the tempo of their storytelling, in their use of language, in the precision of their observations, in their casting of images, in their construction of characters, that somehow, oh, the characters that somehow feel lifelike, but oh, it could only inhabit a fiction by one of them. Nabokov said that all great stories are great fairy tales, and that's what Julie Schumacher, Melissa Bank, and Juno Diaz write every time they sit down. Each of the writers reading tonight is someone I knew when they were students 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> like their fiction, they were irresistible good company, and they each had an uncanny way of knowing when the right moment was to knock on somebody's door and share, uh, give them the gift of their own company. It has been a pleasure to keep their company through the years in their, as their books were published. Although they weren't here, they were here in their books. I like to think that good books come from good people. That's not always the case, but it is definitely the case with these Cornell writers. Uh, they're going to reread in reverse alphabetical order, so I ask you to welcome first Julie Schumacher. That was great. I'm totally thrilled to be in this company with Juno and Melissa. I knew Melissa here when I was going through the MFA program, but uh, oldest goes first. I did not know Juno while you're here. Um, thanks very much to Stephanie and to Elena Veramontes and Laurel Guy, wherever you are, for getting me through the Detroit airport um, when I got stuck there, and um, to the students here at the program. Um, Let's see, I'm going to read um, the first half of a story, because I don't have any stories that are short enough, and I don't want to take up your whole evening here. Can you hear me? Is this okay? And um, this story, I mentioned this afternoon that, for me, the MFA program was this kind of marvelous parentheses around my life, because I'd been working as a secretary in New York, typing for um, a gynecology magazine, which was called <laughs> The Female Patient. That was how I was earning my living. And, um, <laughs> It was kind of a weird job in a lot of ways. <laughs> I won't go into the details, but this, uh, you can see where the material for this story came from. Um, again, I'll just read the first half of it, and um, it's called Patient Female. 
Also, it's in sections, and I'll just read the numbers before each section as I get to them. One, because he lives near the hospital where I work, I spend every evening, every Wednesday evening, at the apartment of a 78-year-old man who has emphysema. He waits for the sound of my key in the lock. As soon as I step through the door, it begins. Harassment, jokes, evasions, lies. What did you do today? I ask him, dropping my bag and kicking my shoes off onto the rug. I walk the dog. He sips at the air and exhales while he talks. I know he hasn't left the apartment. His dog has been dead for several years. I head for the kitchen and line up the pills he's supposed to be taking. The alpha blocker for prostate, the blood pressure meds, the simvastatin for high cholesterol, the vitamins, the baby aspirin. This last is a challenge. He is insulted to have been prescribed a children's chewable. You're later than usual today, he says. I hear him shuffling from the rug onto the linoleum behind me. His apartment consists of two small bedrooms, a kitchen, a bathroom, a living room, and a carpeted hallway that smells of smoke. He used to smoke. So, he says, busy day at the clinic? I pull the plastic off two microwave dinners and refuse to answer. I used to lose track of the days, he says. Both his hands shake as if he were trying to open a pair of jars. But not anymore. You probably never lose track. I bet you always know when it's Wednesday. Are you asking me about my job? No, he says, that's not a job. I pour him half a glass of Ensure, which he ignores. It's vulgar, he says. It isn't vulgar. Of course, we've been over this before, but because of his age and his selective memory, I revive all the usual arguments. Mechanics take their cars apart. Dental students rehearse in each other's mouths. It's not your mouth they're staring at, is it? He picks up his pills and swallows the first one, his spine as stiff as a crochet hook. I hope you aren't doing it for the money. How would that be different from prostitution? <laughs> During an earlier and more experimental period of my life, I briefly dabbled in prostitution, but he doesn't know that. <laughs> hey, he says, what's the difference between deer nuts and beer nuts? The microwave dings. Deer nuts, he says, beginning to laugh without making noise, are under a buck. I open the refrigerator and locate a beer. I try not to think about the evening ahead of us. Hey, ever seen mothballs, he asks. No, the food's ready. It isn't easy, he says. You've got to lift those tiny wings. <laughs> I put the two dinners and two forks on the enamel tabletop, then drink at least half of my beer before sitting down. He gradually eases himself into his chair. His expression sours. You don't need to come here anymore, he says, if it's so unpleasant. Fine, I won't. I put my napkin on my lap. The Salisbury steak in its rectangular compartment is completely tasteless. I chew it as if it were a piece of gum. Are you going to eat anything, I ask, or are you just going to sit there? A couple of his thick, blunt fingers reach for my beer. When your mother died, he says, you apparently lost your sense of humor. I never had a sense of humor, Dad, I say. Two. It isn't exactly hard work being a professional female patient. Every Wednesday at 3.15, I finish my classes, Introduction to Biology, Writing Two, and Family and Consumer Science at the community college. Then I drive across town to the medical school hospital complex, where I park in the visitor's lot, flash my ID badge at the entrance, and head for the clinic. I strip off my clothes and stash them in a locker. I wash up. Then I put on a blue gown printed with shooting stars and take my place on the paper-covered exam exam table in room nine. The students and interns trickle into the room in groups of two or three so they can learn from each other. They're training in OBGYN, in family practice, internal medicine, emergency medicine, even pediatrics. Some, as soon as the door closes behind them, are nervous laughers, where's the hidden camera, as if they suspect they might be the objects of a joke. Others, usually the women, are annoyingly reverent. I have seen plenty of hands tremble when they reach for the cotton bow to untie my gown. There is a proper order to these things, a protocol. May I look at your breasts? Against the protocol. I am going to examine your breasts is preferred. <laughs> Eye contact with several fingers in the vagina? No, against the protocol. <laughs> I see speculum? Take that out right now and warm it under water, I say. It is my job to teach them and to correct them. 
They're the ones with the knowledge, the brains, the future salaries. But for now, in a marvelous one-of-a-kind reversal of roles, I am the one in charge. Introduce yourself, I say, when they forget. Start over. Shake my hand, then wash your hands, not the other way around. <laughs> I remind them to ask me about my allergy to latex. I tell them to describe what they're doing and to be straightforward, even to imagine that the patient, who can't see what they're doing, I have a mirror but I don't always use it, might be blind. Now I'm going to guide your left foot over here, let your knees fall apart. I'm going to cover you with a drape across your thighs. I don't let them neglect or forget anything. I tell them to remember it alphabetically, breasts, cervix, ovaries, uterus. Lying on my back, I take them through it, one at a time. You're pinching, I say, move your left hand. Some of them are half asleep on their feet. They work like dogs. Three, my mother died of ovarian cancer. My father called me. I was living several hours away with a friend to say she wasn't feeling well, and she was dead a month later. My father and I spent the week in which she was nearly comatose on morphine, arguing in the hall outside her room. I told him I was going to move back home. But my father and I could not live together, so I would find my own apartment. I decided that I wanted to take a few classes, maybe go to college. I'm hoping you can pay for my education, I said. I know you've set some money aside. So, you're standing here asking me for money, my father said. A woman in scrubs steered a gurney around us. What happened to your other plans, he asked. What happened to traveling around the country, doing drugs and getting arrested? <laughs> That was a misdemeanor, I said. On the other side of the door, which was ajar, my mother's head was thrown back. Her mouth was open. She appeared to be swallowing daylight, filling her body with as much of it as she could hold. She's going to want to know what you're up to, my father said. You could go ask her what she thinks. Through the half-open door, I watched my mother summoning radiance from all four corners of the room from the window and the tile floor and the diaphanous hanging curtains in their silver rings, all the light in the world assembling itself and funneling toward her. It's too late for me to ask her anything, I said. A thin wire of rage lit up within me. You should have known she was sick. Yeah, well, I'm not doing so well myself, my father said. Four. My best friend, Cheryl, former shoplifter, co-delinquent friend of my youth, was the one who hooked me up with a professional patient job. She was a professional female patient. The doctors called us teaching patients at two different hospitals for several years. Then she had a baby and resigned. Too many hands, is what she said. She couldn't stand any more people touching her, even her husband, especially her husband, she said. He gets a look in his eye, Lissy, and I swear to God, Cheryl used to tell me it was like acting on a tiny stage. So I try to vary the experience in case the students, standing with their backs against the wall and waiting their turns, are comparing notes. I can be belligerent one minute, slow-witted the next. Sometimes I put the gown on backwards. Let them decide how to handle it. <laughs> You're the undress rehearsal, Cheryl used to say. Five. Why are you sitting in the dark? I ask him the next week after work. I brought him some groceries. I turn on the overhead light in the kitchen, noting that its cake-shaped glass bowl is full of dead moths. Wednesday, he says. He's got his oxygen on, the portable tank next to him on the rug like a faithful dog. He was supposed to die before my mother, but life is full of little surprises. I set the groceries down by the sink. We buried my mother nine months ago, but her to-do list is still taped to the windowsill. Did you get out for a walk, I ask. My father rouses himself. He must have fallen asleep on the couch and slowly stands up. Uh, the world wasn't prepared for me today, he says I had too much potential. <laughs> Wednesday used to be your day for playing cards with Martin. I open the freezer. Have you seen him lately? Martin's dead. Martin's not dead. He lives at Longview. Why have you got so much ice? The freezer holds one ancient package of sausage. I look at the date and throw it away. One bag of peas, half a dozen plastic containers full of ice. Additional cubes overflow their holding tank in the corner. Your mother loved ice, my father says. I put the peas on the counter and shut the freezer, remembering my mother dropping ice cubes into her coffee, her orange juice, her milk. You know, you could visit Martin at Longview. Assisted living is not contagious. 
If you want to see him so much, you go visit him, my father says. I didn't think you were coming tonight. I thought you said you were going out. Yeah, Cheryl was busy, I shrugged. She had to cancel. Standing on the threadbare carpet runner in the hall, my father blinks. His scalp is spotted like the skin of a rainbow trout. He raises his eyebrows. Cheryl has a baby. She's going to be busy for 20 years. <laughs> I put two pots of water onto boil. Do you want to know what really bothers me? My father asks. No, I don't. <laughs> what really bothers me, he says, is that there is no such thing as a professional patient. People in hospitals are always amateurs. His slippers are held together with electrical tape. I'm training doctors, I tell him. That's not why you're doing it, he says. I open a package of spaghetti, then lift the W for Wednesday in the weekly row of my father's pills. Are you embarrassed of me, I ask. Is that it? Are you embarrassed because I'm not modest? When I'm embarrassed of you, I'll tell you, my father says. I watch him attempt to pluck his pills from their narrow compartment, but his hands are shaking and his thumb is too big. I take hold of his hand, turn it over, and dump the pills into his palm, his skin as thick and smooth as polished wood. A guy walks into a bar with a duck on his head. He mutters, concentrating on the pills. I give him a coffee mug half full of water. The bartender looks at the guy and then at the duck. He says, what can I get you? You've already told me this one, I say. The man says, nothing for me, but then the duck on his head pipes up. Can you get this guy off my ass? <laughs> I feel as if the air in the apartment has gotten thinner, or as if someone has siphoned the oxygen out of my lungs. I definitely can't come next week, I say. You know, telling jokes is not the same as having a conversation. My father puts the first pill on his tongue. Your mother died on a Wednesday, he says. She died on a Friday, 4.15. Well, same difference my father says. Six. During clinic the following week, I try to establish an efficient pace. I've got 15 interns and students in groups of three, each student having been lectured about my pedagogical purpose and my superiority to the plastic torso down the hall. <laughs> I put my fingers inside of it once. The vagina was long and narrow like a garden hose. Because I've been coaching a petite East Indian woman through what she clearly feels is a humiliation for both of us, I haven't noticed the fair-skinned, dark-haired, would-be doctor waiting his turn at the side of the room. Only when he steps toward the table do I remember his face. I know him, Jerry Tomo. I knew him in high school. Not very well, we didn't exactly travel in the same circles, but he was the kind of person everyone knew. I've got enough time to straighten my gown and say, sorry, personal acquaintance, but any objection would seem belated since he's been watching the other exams from three feet away. Also, he hasn't said anything, which means I could be mistaken. If he was Jerry Tomo, he probably would have excused himself. Instead, sure-footed and graceful, a Gene Kelly of the exam room, he steps toward me and smiles. I'm Dr. Tomo, I'm here to do your exam. Perfect form, A plus, we shake hands. Do you have any questions or particular concerns today? I open my mouth, then close it. He strides to the sink. Allergies to latex? He turns off the faucet with a paper towel. I let him guide me into position on the table and open the top half of my gown, the little bow giving way with a hiss. Again, the brief, reassuring smile, and then Jerry is all business. The other students crane their necks to observe as he palpates my breasts, a privilege I would have paid $100 for in high school. <laughs> Any tenderness, he asks. Not coming from you, I imagine saying. <laughs> Slide down to the end of the table, he says. You'll feel my hand against your thigh. He warms the speculum in water, then snaps on the gloves. Cervix over his uterus. I examine a stain on the tile ceiling. Everything seems normal. We are all done now, Jerry says. He helps me up. The East Indian woman bows to me by way of thanks. Jerry holds the door for her as they leave the room. Seven. Guess who I saw today? My father and I are eating dinner, tuna casserole with olives. I added the olives on a high calorie whim at the last minute and they crop up bleak and oily surprises among the noodles. Jerry Tomo. My father nudges a couple of olives toward the edge of his plate. From high school, I add. I don't remember, did you go out with him? No. The only people I went out with in high school were Cheryl and her older brother, Dale, who is now safely tucked away from the public eye somewhere in Texas. 
Jerry Tomo was on the baseball and basketball teams, I say. My father is squinting at his plate as if trying to understand its contents. And now he's a doctor. And you saw him where? I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was a wonderful half story, right? Yeah. Uh, Guys, please, another hand while I... Y'all clap for her, please. Julie, thank you. Yeah. Julie, that was wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, I'd like to thank my fellow readers. I'd like to thank the department, Cornell, of course, for having me. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Well, there was no significance to that. I was just noticing how many of you there are. Yeah. So, um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I never write anything new, so I always read the same old shit, which is, it's the nature of my situation, yeah. So I will read just a, a fragment of a story. And uh, then we'll continue, yeah? So, uh, I was gonna, uh, I've been curious about this, because everybody I meet seems to be studying it, so I wanted to know how many uh, writers there are in here. <laughs> Trap, they're clapping to give you heart, you guys. <laughs> yeah, let's try that again. How many writers are there here? Okay. Yeah. It is an interesting profession, without question. Yeah? We are desperate for your work, so please get to it. Yeah. <laughs> please get to it. Okay. Uh, you don't gotta know much. This is just a story. Another one, like uh, I've been writing this series of stories, one every like four years, uh, about. Uh, um, and I'm kind of like four years behind, so I'm like, uh, it's, uh, been writing this story, series of stories about infidelity. So you don't gotta know much. It's set in New Jersey. This narrator's name's Junior, and um, it's. Uh, we're only gonna read the half of it, I mean a third of it, so when somebody gets sand on their butt, wake up, clap, that'll be the end of it, yeah? <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, it's called The Sun, The Moon, and The Stars, so it goes like this. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, again, it's just so short, this is the only way to waste time. It's like that, the terrible thing that you're never supposed to do, yeah? which is when you're like fighting with somebody who you're thinking about dumping the fuck out of them, you should never go on a trip with them, yeah? <laughs> yeah? Which seems, seems to be like, for some strange reason, like the dividing line between like being in high school and being in college. Like in high school, you can never go to fuck away with somebody you hate, but it seems like in college, we all do it. Oh my God, Maureen, what's going on? I didn't even see you there. Yeah, so, yeah. All right, so uh, it's just called, um, it's called the sun, the moon, the stars, and that's that, all right? So, and just for those of you who have not done this, yeah, I would say don't do it, but you know you're gonna fucking do it, so <laughs> just mark my words, yeah? All right, here we go. Sun, the moon, the stars. I am not a bad guy. I know how that sounds, defensive and unscrupulous, but it is true. I am like everyone else, weak, full of mistakes, but basically good. Magdalena disagrees, though. She considers me a typical Dominican man, a sucio, an asshole, because you see, many months ago, 
when Magdalena was still my girlfriend and I didn't have anything to be to worry about. I cheated on her with this chick who had tons of 80s freestyle hair. <laughs> I did not I did not I did not tell Magda about it either. You know how that is. A smelly bone like that better off buried in the backyard of your life. Magda only found out because homegirl wrote her a fucking letter. <laughs> and and that letter had details shit you wouldn't even tell your boys drunk. <laughs> the thing is, the thing is that particular bit of stupidity had been over for months. Me and Magda were on an upswing. We weren't as distant as we'd been the winter I was cheating. The freeze was over. She was coming over to my place, and instead of us hanging out with my knucklehead boys, we were seeing movies together, driving out different places to eat. He even caught a play at the Crossroads Theater, and I took her picture with some big wig black playwrights, pictures where she's smiling so much that you would think her wide ass mouth was going to unhinge. <laughs> we, we were a couple again, visiting each other's families on weekends, eating breakfast at diners, rummaging through the New Brunswick Library, a nice rhythm we had going. But then the letter hits like a Star Trek grenade and detonates everything past, present, and future. And suddenly, her folks want to kill me. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter that I help them with their taxes two years in a row, or, or that I mow their lawn. Her father, her father, who used to treat me like his son, calls me an asshole on the phone and sounds like he's strangling himself with the cord. <laughs> you, you, no deserve I speak Spanish, he says. I see one of Magda's girlfriends at the Woodbridge Mall, Clarabelle, the Equatoriana with the biology degree and the chinita eyes, and she treats me like I ate someone's favorite fucking kid. <laughs> you, 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 you don't even want to hear, you don't even want to hear how it went down with Magda, like a five train collision. She threw Cassandra's letter at me, and then she sat down on the curb and started hyperventilating. Oh, God, she wailed. Oh, my God. This is when my boys claim they would have pulled a total fucking denial. Cassandra who? But I was too sick to my stomach to even try that shit. I sat down next to Magda, grabbed her flailing arms, and said some dumbness like, you have to listen to me, Magda, or you won't understand. Okay. So we get it. You know, He's kind of a major dumbass, yeah? So they got this trip. Like I said, we're just going to jump around. They got this trip. Uh, they're trying to decide whether they're going to go or not. He, of course, wants her to go because he thinks that she says yes, then everything will be cool. And she's kind of like, fuck you, but here we go. You know? they, they make it to Santo Domingo, all right? So, um, yeah, it goes like this. Um, her girlfriends, the sorest losers on the planet, advised Magda to take the trip and then never to speak to me again. She, of course, told me this shit because she could not help herself from telling me everything that she was thinking. I asked her, what do you think about that suggestion? And she shrugged, it is an idea. Even my boys were like, nigger, it sounds like you are wasting a whole lot of loot on some bullshit. <laughs> but, but I really thought it would be good for us, yeah? Deep down where my boys don't know me, I am an optimist, and I thought, me and Magda and Santo Domingo, what couldn't this cure? Let me confess, I love Santo Domingo. I love coming home to the guys in the blazers trying to push little cups of Brugal in my hands. I love the plane landing, Everybody clapping when the wheels kiss the runway. 
I love the fact that I'm the only Negro on board without a Cuban link or a flapjack of makeup on my face. I love the redhead woman on her way to meet the daughter she has not seen in 11 years, the gifts she holds on her laps like the bones of a saint. Mi hija has tetas now, the woman whispers. The last time I saw her, she could not speak. Now she is a woman, imaginate. I love the bags my mother packs, shit for relatives and something for Magda, a gift. You give this to her no matter what happens. If this was another kind of story, I would tell you about the sea, what it looks like after it's been forced into, a sky, into the sky through a blowhole, how when I'm driving in from the airport and see it like this, like shredded silver, I know I am back for real. And I would tell you about how many poor motherfuckers there are, more albinos, more cross-eyed niggers, more tigres than you will ever see. And I would tell you about the traffic, the entire history of late 20th century automobiles swarming across every flat stretch of ground, a cosmology of battered cars, battered motorcycles, battered trucks, and battered buses, and an equal number of repair shops run by any fool with a wrench. And I would tell you about our shanties and our no running water faucets and the sambos on the billboards and the fact that my family house comes equipped with the ever reliable latrine. And I would tell you about my abuelo and his campo hands and how hap unhappy he is that I'm not sticking around for longer. And I would tell you about the street where I was born, Calle 21, how it hasn't yet decided if it wants to be a slum or not and how it has been in this state of indecision for years. But that would make this another kind of story and I am having enough trouble with this one as it is. <laughs> You'll You'll have to take my word for it. Santo Domingo is Santo Domingo. Let's all pretend we know what goes on there. So they get to the island. We're almost there, guys. Yeah. Um, uh, they get to the island and sort of the, they got like a different philosophy. He wanted to kind of just hop buses and go see the whole country, yeah? But she wants to just crash out on a resort and just chill. So we know who wins. And we join our loving dumbass there, okay? By the middle, by the middle of day three of our all Kiskeya redemption tour, we were in an air-conditioned bungalow watching HBO. Exactly where I want to be when I'm in Santo Domingo, in a fucking resort. Magda is reading a book by a trappist in a better mood, I guess, and I'm sitting on the edge of the bed, fingering my useless map. And I am thinking, for this, I deserve something nice, something physical, yeah? Me and Magda were pretty damn casual about the sex, usually, but ever since the breakup, shit had gotten weird. First of all, it wasn't regular like before, and I'm lucky to score some once a week, and I have to nudge her to start things up or we will not fuck at all. And she plays like she doesn't want it, and sometimes she doesn't, which then I gotta cool it. But other times, she does want it. And I have to touch her pussy, which is my way of initiating things, of saying, so how about we kick it, mommy? And she, and she, will, turn, and she will turn her head, which is her way of saying, I am too proud to acquiesce openly to your animal desires, <laughs> but, but, but if you continue to put your finger in me, I will not stop you. <laughs> today, today we started, no problem. And then, but then halfway through, Magda said, wait, we shouldn't. And I said, why? She closed her eyes like she's embarrassed at herself. Forget about it, she said, her hips moving under me. Just forget about it. Okay, we're almost last section. Uh, I mean, how many folks are here from Santo Domingo, from the Dominican Republic? They're like, we got one, two? Usually y'all clap, you must be real scared. <laughs> so yeah, oh, we got somebody? God bless you, yo. So this next scene takes place in our nightmarish resort to end all resorts, uh, Casa de Campo. You ever been there? Mm, here we go. 
I do not even want to tell you where we are at. We are in Casa de Campo, the shame, the resort that shame forgot. The average asshole would love this place. It is the largest, wealthiest resort on the island, which means it's a goddamn fortress walled away from everyone else with guards and peacocks and ambitious topiaries everywhere. <laughs> it advertises itself in the States as its own country, and it might as well be. It has its own airport, 36 holes of golf, and beaches so white they ache to be trampled. And the only island Dominicans that you're guaranteed to see are either changing your sheets or caked up with money. Let's just say my abuelo has never been here, and neither has yours. This is where the Garcias and the Colons come to relax after a long month of oppressing the masses. <laughs> you, you chill here too long and you will have your ghetto pass revoked, no questions asked. <laughs> yeah. So me and Magda wake up bright and early for the buffet and I want to talk about what happened the night before, but when I bring it up, Magda puts down her pen and jams on her shades. I feel like you're pressuring me, she says. And I say, how am I pressuring you? And she says, I just want some space to myself every now and then. Every time I'm with you, I have this feeling that you want something from me. And I say, time to yourself? What does that mean? And she says, like maybe once a day, you do one thing and I do another. Like when? Like now? It doesn't have to be now. She looks exasperated. Why don't we just go down to the beach? As we walk over to the courtesy golf cart, I say, I feel like you've rejected my whole country, Magda. Don't be ridiculous. She drops her hand in my lap. I just wanted to relax. What's wrong with that? The sun is blazing, and the blue of the ocean is an overload on the brain. Casa de Campo has got beaches the way the rest of the island has got problems. These, though, have no merengue, no little kids, nobody trying to tell you chicharrones, and there is a massive melanin deficit in evidence. <laughs> every 50 feet, every 50 feet, there's at least one Euro fuck beached out on a towel like some scary pale monster that the sea has vomited up. <laughs> They look, they look like philosophy professors, like, they look like philosophy professors, like budget Foucaults, and too many of them, and too many of them are in the company of dark ass Dominican girls. I mean it, these girls can be no older than 16, look puro and genio to me. Magda is rocking an Ochun colored bikini that her girlfriends picked out for her so that she could torture me. And I'm in these old ruined trunks that say Sandy Hook forever. <laughs> I, I, I will admit it, with Magda half naked in public, I am feeling vulnerable and uneasy. I put my hand on her knee. I just wish you would say you love me. Junior, please. Can you say you like me a lot? Can you leave me alone? You are such a pestilence. So I let the sun stake me out to the sand. It is disheartening me and Magda together. We do not look like a couple. When she smiles, niggers ask for her hand in marriage. And when I smile, everybody starts checking for their wallets. Magda. <laughs> Magda, Magda's been, Magda has been a star the entire time that we have been on the island. You know how it is when you're back home and your girlfriend is an octoroon. The brothers go apeshit. On the buses, the machos were like, Tu si eres bella, muchacha. And every time I dip into the water for a swim, some Mediterranean messenger of love starts rapping to her. And of course, I'm not polite. Why don't you beat it, Pancho? We're here on our honeymoon. There's, there's even this one, this one squid who's mad persistent, who sits down next to her so that he can impress her with the hair around his nipples. And instead of ignoring him, she starts a conversation with the guy. And yeah, it turns out that he's Dominican too. 
from Washington Heights, an assistant DA who says he loves his people. Better I am their prosecutor, he says. At least I understand them. And I am thinking he sounds like the sort of nigger who in the old days used to lead Buana to the rest of us. After about three minutes of him, I can't take it anymore, and I say, Magda, stop talking to that asshole. The assistant DA startles. I know you're not talking to me, he says. And I say, actually, I am. This, Magda says, is unbelievable. She gets to her feet and walks stiff-legged towards the water. She's got a half moon of sand stuck to her butt, a total fucking heartbreak. Homeboy is saying something else to me, but I'm not listening. I already know what Magda will say when she sits back down. Time for you to do one thing and me to do another. Thank you. Don't stop, don't stop. You keep going. <laughs> God, um, there are people who are standing here, which really impresses me. Maybe you'd like to come and sit down, because there's some seats. I'm not going to read long, don't worry, that's, no, that's not what I mean. Um, <laughs> does somebody, would, would, do you want to raise your hand if you've got an empty seat next to you so these people can come down and sit down? Don't be shy, you're tired, it's Friday. No? All right, no, I get that too, need to go in case it's real bad. So I'm going to read a whole story. It's really long because <laughs> you haven't had enough reading. I'm reading the uh, title story of this book, which is The Wonder Spot. I've never read with glasses before. It's weird. That's what happens when you get older. You need glasses. Heads up. Seth talks me into going to a party in Brooklyn. He says that we can just drop by. I tell him that a party in Brooklyn is a commitment. It takes effort. It's like a wedding. You can't just drop by. <laughs> we can just drop by, he says again, and he gives me a look that means we can do anything we want. This will be our first party as a couple. He says, it'll be fun. My boyfriend is a decade younger than I am. He is full of hope. <laughs> we drive to Brooklyn in his old Mustang convertible with the top down. Because of the wind and because I'm on the side of Seth's bad ear, we can't really talk, or I can't. But he tells me that we're going to Williamsburg, the section of Brooklyn that's been called the new downtown. After the party, we can walk around and have dinner at a restaurant his friend Bob is about to open there. Bob has offered to let us try everything on the menu to be if we'll help him name the restaurant. The finalists are the Shiny Diner, Bob's, and the Wonder Spot. Start thinking, Seth says, and I do. Across the bridge and into the land of Brooklyn, we go under overpasses and down streets so dark and deserted you know they're used only to get lost on. And I get a pang for Manhattan, where I'm never farther than a block from a bodega, never more than a raised arm from a cab. But then we turn a corner and, lights, people, action, we park. Walking to the party, I tell Seth about the Williamsburg I've already been to, the one in Virginia. <laughs> I expect him to have heard of it. He's from Canada and knows more about the United States than I do, but he hasn't. I tell him that I was five or six at the time, and I didn't understand the concept of historical reenactment. I thought that we just found a place where women in bonnets churned butter and men in breeches shoot horses. <laughs> I tell him the real drama of the trip. 
I lost the dollar my father had given me for the gift shop. I'm having such a good time that I forget about the party until we're on the elevator up. I say, maybe we should have a code for I want to go. He starts to make a joke but sees I'm serious and squeezes my hand three times. I okay the code. The elevator door opens right into the loft. I was counting on those extra few seconds of hallway before facing the party, the party we are now part of and in, a party with people talking and laughing and having a party time. I think, I am a solid trying to do a liquid's job. <laughs> I am only a third joking when I squeeze Seth's hand three times. <laughs> he squeezes back four, and before I can ask what four means, our hostess is upon us. She is tall and slinky with ultra short hair and a gold dot in one of her perfect nostrils. I feel every pound of my weight, every year of my age, until Seth tells her, this is my girlfriend, Sophie. I smile up at this ghosty pale, sweetie pie man of mine. As soon as our hostess slinks off to greet her next arrivals, I say, what does four mean? It means I love you too, he says. I want to be happy to hear these words. It's the first time we've squeezed them. <laughs> but I feel so close to him at, the, at this moment, I say the truth, which is, I feel old. He puts his coat around my shoulders and says, is that better? And I realize that I've spoken into his bad ear. <laughs> I nod and we move deeper into the party. He introduces me as his girlfriend to each of the friends we pass, all of whom seem happy to meet me and I think, I am his girlfriend, Sophie. I am girlfriend. I am Sophie, girlfriend of Seth. <laughs> I'm fine, even super fine, until he goes to get a glass of wine for me. Now I look around trying to pretend, as I always do at parties, that I could be talking to a fellow partygoer if I wanted to, but at the moment I'm just too captivated by my own fascinating observations of the crowd. <laughs> the women are young, 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 liquidy and sweet looking. They are batter and I am the sponge cake they don't know they'll become. <laughs> I stand here, a lone loaf, stuck to the pan. It is at this moment that I see Vincent, only from behind, and it's been years, but I know it's him. I've told Seth almost nothing about my ex-boyfriends. Now he'll meet the one who told me that my head was too big for my body. <laughs> When Seth returns with my wine, he says, still cold, and he rubs my shoulders. A small crowd gathers around us, the drummer in Seth's band and his entourage, girlfriend, brother, and girlfriend of brother. They try to talk to me, and I try to talk back. One of the girlfriends, I'm not sure whose, works in public radio. Since I'm a public radio lover, I can keep this conversation going program to program until she asks what I do. I say that I do research for a PBS talk show, but add that what I love doing better than anything at the moment, and what I'm getting damn good at, is practicing the lost, of this, the lost art of the silhouette. I mime cutting, which leads to an almost post-nuclear silence. <laughs> but the girlfriend who works in public radio says, people? And animals, I say. <laughs> that sounds fun. I say, it's stressful. <laughs> and she laughs, and we are insta-friends. <laughs> then we girlfriends go back to them boyfriends. I plant myself beside Seth like a fire hydrant, my back to where I imagine Vincent to be. But he's not. He's right across the room his arms slung like a belt around the hips of a girl who I can tell right away is a model. She has the long straight hair I used to wish for and sky high thighs I can see through her mesh stockings. Just like the bad old days, Vincent doesn't seem to recognize me. Then he does. 
I inadvertently squeeze Seth's hand and he smiles without looking at me like we have a secret language and I wish we did. <laughs> I watch Vincent steer his girlfriend toward us. He's grown his hair long and now sports a Lucifer-style beard and mustache. <laughs> Plus, he's wearing a shirt with a huge pointy collars jutting out like fangs over his jacket. When he reaches us, I say, Happy Halloween. <laughs> Hello, Sophie, he says, Dr. Droll. I say, Seth, this is... Vincent interrupts and introduces himself, Enzo. Enzo, I say. He doesn't answer, and I remember his New Jersey friends calling him Vinny, and his firm correction, Vincent. Vinny, Vincent, Enzo, pulls his model front and center and says, this is Amanda. I'm Sophie. Then I get to say, this is my boyfriend, Seth. Hi. She is both cool and chirpy, an ice check. We know each other, she says about the man I've just introduced as my boyfriend, and she kisses him. Just his cheek, but so far back that her pouty mouth appears to be traveling neck or earward. I stare at her even while I'm telling myself not to. I fall under the spell not of her eyes, but her eyebrows, which are perfectly arched and skinny and make me aware of my own thick and feral pair. <laughs> Mine are a forest, and hers are a trail. When I blink myself out of my trance, Vincent is saying, whenever anyone would say, small world, Sophie used to say, actually, it's medium-sized. I say I was about 11 when I knew Vincent. Then, like the hostess my mother taught me to be, I say, Vincent, I correct myself, Enzo is a musician, too. I used to be, he says, and names the best known of the bands he played in, though I happen to know it was only for about 15 minutes. Then he asks Seth, who do you play with? Seth says the name of the band, and I can tell Vincent's impressed and doesn't want to be. He fast talks about starting up a startup, an online recording studio, a real-time distribution outlet, a virtual music label. He goes on and on. Vincent style, grandiose and impossible to understand. I say, basically, you do everything but teach kindergarten. Vincent says, there is an educational component. <laughs> Seth squeezes my hand three times. Oh, shoot, I say, looking at my wrist for a watch I'm not wearing. We have to go. And I love the sound of we, and I love that it's Seth who wants to go, and I love that we are going. Vincent says they're headed to another party themselves. He kisses both my cheeks, what must now be the signature Enzo kiss. <laughs> and he looks at me as though he cares deeply for me, a look I never got when we were together, a look that Seth notices, and I think, phew. Seth will think another man loved me. He will think I am the lovable kind of woman, the kind of man better love right or somebody else will. Vincent says, you look great, Sophie. And I think of saying, whereas you look a little strange. <laughs> but, I just, but I just say, see you, Vinny. A few more pleasantries, and Seth and I are on the elevator, just the two of us, pressing one. I say, good thing she was just a model. I'm giddy, talking fast and happy. I think that would have been really hard if she were a supermodel. <laughs> Seth looks at me, not sure what I mean. Out on the street, I say, how do you know her, by the way? And instantly regret how deliberately offhanded I sound. I don't really know her, he says. She came up to me after a show a few weeks ago. I think, came up to you or onto you. But I give myself the open, amused look of a bystander eager to hear more about one of life's funny little coincidences. <laughs> she asked me if I would help her celebrate her half birthday, he says. And his tone tells me I would be crazy to think he'd ever be interested in her. 
Unfortunately, now I am crazy, and I have to stop myself from saying a tone deaf and tone dumb, so you're saying you didn't eat her half birthday cake? Suddenly I feel like I'm Mary Poppins, floating with an umbrella and a spoonful of sugar into the city of sexual menace, population a million models with ultra short and long straight hair and pouty mouths and thighs you can see through mesh stockings. From there I go straight to, this will never work. He has models coming onto him after his show. He'll be 49 when you're turning 60. He is young and hip, and you don't even know the hip word for hip anymore. <laughs> you belong at home in bed with a book. I remind myself that this is what I always say and what I always do. As soon as I'm in a relationship, I promote fear from clerk to president, even though all it can do is sweep up, turn off the lights, and lock the door. I am so deep in my own argument that I almost don't hear Seth say, Sophie. He stops me on the pavement and turns me toward him. His, his face practically glows white. He is a ghost of the ghost he usually looks like. He says, when did you go out with him? So long ago, he had a different name. <laughs> Beelzebub? <laughs> I tell him that Vincent was still in purgatory when I knew him. <laughs> but it was hard for you to see him with somebody else tonight? No, I say, a little surprised. He nods, not quite believing, but the thing you said about her being a model. Models are always hard, I say, and it was hard to see her necking with your cheek. After I've said this, I want to say that I don't usually use the word neck as a verb. It's a 50s word, my mother's word, but he is shaking his head, and I can see he is not thinking about how old I sound or look or am. Obviously, he still has a thing for you, Seth says, and shakes his head and swallows a couple of times like he's trying to get rid of a bad taste, the way he looked at you. My few gives me an Indian burn of shame. That look was for Amanda's sake, I say, and I know it's true. For a second, I am an older sister to my younger self. If she brings it up later, I say, he'll tell her she's crazy. Very nice, Seth says, and his voice tells me that he doesn't want to hear any more about Vincent and Amanda. He doesn't care about them, and that he's wishing he didn't care so much about me. It scares me. But then I get this big feeling, simple, but exalted. He's like me, just with different details. His eyes are closed, and I think maybe he's picturing me with Vincent or other men he assumes I've slept with or loved. Maybe he's telling himself that he's too tall or doesn't hear well enough. Usually he pulls me in for the hug, but now I do it. I pull him in, and we stay like this his chin on my head, my face on his chest. I find myself picturing Amanda at another party with Vincent and feeling sorry for her. It occurs to me that if I were as beautiful as she is, every passing half birthday would be harder to celebrate. But mostly I am just glad I am not her and glad we are not them and glad just to be out here on the curb breathing the sweet air of Williamsburg and post-colonial freedom. <laughs> we are quiet for a while, walking. I begin to see where we are now. We pass the Miss Williamsburg Diner, little bookstores I could spend my life in, we pass a gallery with mobiles hung above a reflecting pool. Then we're standing in a parking lot outside of what Seth tells me is Bob's restaurant. I'm saying that living in Manhattan gives you a heightened appreciation of parking lots. When Seth t takes something out of his pocket and puts it in my hand, it's a dollar for the gift shop, he says. Don't lose it now. With my dollar hand, I squeeze Seth's hand about 37 times, <laughs> telling him everything I feel. He says, what does that mean? 
I say, I'm hungry. <laughs> what I feel is, right now I am having the life I want here outside the shiny diner, Bob's, or the wonder spot, with my dollar to spend and dinner to come. We will try everything on the menu. Then we will drive through Brooklyn and cross the bridge with the Manhattan skyline in front of us, which looks new to me every time I see it, and we will drive right into it. We'll find a parking space a few blocks from my apartment on 10th Street, and we'll pick up milk and tomorrow's paper. We will undress and get into bed. Thank you. <laughs>